Hey world, Dan Brown here with another edition of EDH Rec Tech, the Magic the Gathering deck building show, where we focus on the variant known as Elder Dragon Highlander, uh, and I use the popular online deck building tool EDH Rec to help y'all help yourselves uh, to either be uh, guided by the wisdom of the masses or to not be led astray by the idiocy of the masses um, as per EDH Rex uh, signature cards for given commanders. This week we're going to be looking at Marin of Clan Neltoth. There she is. Take a look. Uh, the way EDH Rec works is they have crowdsourced thousands of deck lists and use that uh, pool of information to suss out some valuable data for planeswalkers like uh, yourself and myself here whenever we're either trying to build a brand new deck or make tweaks to decks that we already have. Um, there's a section specifically on each commander's landing page on EDH Rec uh, called Signature Cards. Those are cards that are disproportionately prevalent in given commanders, you know, 99 main deck, as compared to other commanders of the same color identity. Those are what we're going to be looking at. I'm going to be sharing my opinions as to uh, whether those cards are good or bad, and hopefully we'll all learn a thing or two in the process. Uh, meanwhile, here is Marin, four mana for a legendary creature, as they all are. She's a human. Human shaman. Shaman. She's a human. Whenever another creature you control dies, you get an experience counter. At the beginning of your end step, choose target creature card in your graveyard. If that card's CMC is less than or equal to the number of experience counters that you have, return it to the battlefield. Otherwise, put it in your hand. Uh, worth highlighting here that very last line of text sometimes new Marin players forget that you could put a creature in your hand even if you don't have the experience counters to reanimate it. Just a very solid rock, solid reanimator uh, commander. You can do a lot of different things with Marin. Um, I'll get to what I am doing with her in a little bit, but first of all, take a look. Take a look at all these signature cards. Beautiful. Ah, oh, beautiful to look at. Man, so much to say about that slide. Oh, hi, Market! It's hi, Market. Uh, it's a land, non-basic. This is the first signature card. You can tap it to sacrifice a creature and gain a life. It's it's just a sack outlet. It's a sack outlet stapled to a land in a two-color deck. You are not too crunched for color fixing. You know, you don't want to get crazy carried away, but you have more than a few deck slots available for non-basic lands that don't fix your mana and just provide some sort of upside. Marin looking for uh, lots of sack outlets. This is a perfectly viable one. Yes, I think this... I'd go so far is to call that an auto-include. Shriek Maw, on the other hand, I mean, depends on what you're trying to do. In a more toolboxy Marin deck, a deck that um, is trying to win by just being prepared for all sorts of diverse potential situations with all sorts of diverse potential answers that you can fetch directly out of your deck with tutors or like Entomb or Buried Alive effects and then pull from your graveyard, treating your graveyard kind of like an extension of your hand. Um, in that sort of build, Shriek Maw probably has a place. I am not running it in my build because that's not what I'm trying to do. Um, and you always have to consider the worst case scenario when considering whether or not to include a card. And that worst case scenario of Shriek Maw, of course, would be that the creature you desperately need to destroy at sorcery speed is an artifact or a black creature doesn't hit those. So um, just there are better removal options. Although this synergizes with Marin pretty well, right? If you evoke it, you get a uh, death trigger. Uh, you can reanimate it and kind of get this on a Ferris wheel of death. Like it, it can be good. Don't get me wrong. It can be good. I'm just not running it. It's, you know, a bubble card. Razaketh the foul blooded. That's an expensive, like expensive mana cost, eight mana. Better do something good. What's it do? Flying Trample, 8-8. Eight, eight. Oh, that's pretty big. You can pay two life. Sack a creature. Okay, it's a sack outlet. Good. What does that get you? You get to search your library for a card. You get to tutor on a stick by sacking creatures, which is something we already want to do in a 40 life format where two life doesn't really matter that much. And it can punch opponents for eight to boot. Wow. That's a good card. Like, I, 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 I hesitate any time we're talking about an eight mana card, but it replaces itself. Kind of. I mean, yeah, in the context of a Marin deck, you assume you're going to get a creature that you sacrifice back with Marin. So, yeah, it replaces itself and uh, is a huge beater. Yeah, this this is a house. You should probably run this. You don't want to run too many bombs. You don't want your whole deck to be eight drops, but, like, 
you, you, you need a couple eight drops. You don't need a couple eight drops, but if you're going to run an eight drop, this one seems pretty good. Yep, I, I like it. I'm running it. Flesh bag Marauder. Marauder. Um, this is uh, an ability that they have stapled to a few different creatures as an enter the battlefield. Um, it causes each player to sacrifice a creature, including yourself, but you can just sacrifice the Marauder. It's disproportionately beneficial to the player playing a graveyard strategy. That's you. You're playing Marin. Um, you know, the worst case scenario for this card, always want to consider that, is if opponents are playing like token strategies or they're playing graveyard strategies of their own, then you're just, you know, either not really bothering them that much because they can just sack a 1-1 one, one squirrel or you're feeding them gas. You're <laughs> maybe giving their Marin an experience counter, right? Um, not the best card for the mirror match. I am not running this or any card quite like it in my Marin build. But my Marin build is a pretty linear token deck. Uh, it's not a toolboxy Marin deck. In a toolbox Marin deck that's trying to win with more like mid-range flying type uh, things, then uh, yeah, Flesh Bag might be worth including. Uh, I'm, I'm just not including it. Uh, I don't feel like it's an auto-include in Marin, but uh, can be good, no doubt. Victimize. This one, uh, pretty close to auto-include for Marin. It's just super good. It does all sorts of things you want. You have to keep in mind, Marin can only bring back one creature per turn. And often, you're going to have more than one creature in your graveyard. More than three creatures in your graveyard. And this is just a good way to um, help that Ferris Wheel of Death go a little bit faster. Get three times as many ETB triggers from graveyard creatures. Or whatever it might be that you're reanimating. Uh, three times as much in one turn. Yeah, super good. Victimize, super good. Run it in your Marin decks. Almost all of them. Sakura Tribelder, same story. I mean, it's just a... This is a great ramp effect, even if you're not benefiting from sacrificing creatures or being able to bring back creatures from the graveyard. So um, the fact that this synergizes so, so well with Marin, yeah, definitely an auto-include in a Marin deck. You want to run Steve. Get Steve in there, people. Caustic Caterpillar less bullish on this a little bearish on this um not bad to have at least one way in your deck to destroy artifacts or enchantments but one tendency that people have when building edh decks that might not be the best tendency is to overcommit deck slots to cards just because they seem to work well with the commander um, you don't need that many targets for Marin to bring back and sack and bring back and sack. Really, you, you only need one good one, because she can only target one per turn. If you have a sack outlet, you don't need a huge suite of them, unless you're again, going for a kind of toolboxy Marin build. That's not what I'm doing. In a toolbox deck, yeah, this could be good. It could be a good option if you know there emerges a problem artifact or enchantment. But uh, I... I'm trying to just win a race rather than deal with threats. I mean, to a point. I have control answers, obviously, as I do in all of my decks. But, yeah, uh, Caustic Caterpillar, it's another bubble card that I am not running. Same thing with Merciless Executioner. Not a whole lot to say that I didn't already say for Fleshbag Marauder. It's super similar uh, card. Um, I'm just not running it. Same reasoning. Could be good. It's a DC Undade, uh, un undade Vizier. Oh, man. I, I had the correct pronunciation for Vizier in my head, but I just went ahead and mispronounced Undead. That I guess that's just how it goes sometimes. This is a really good card. Like, on its own, it's just a five-mana tutor, basically, on its own, with a little bit of an upside because it's a decent creature body. You can sack a worse creature in, you know, the abstract. But in Marin, you might just cast Sadisi, sack Sadisi to its own exploitability, and then bring it back and just get tutor after tutor after tutor. That seems pretty good. This, this, uh, the only thing that might keep it from being an auto-include is if you're trying to play a really tight curve, but that's probably more competitive of a deck than uh, my target demographic is going to be playing. So DC, I like it a lot. I'm running it for sure. Spore Frog, uh, very, very cute. I mean, not, not, I don't mean cute as in like the abilities cute, although I guess that kind of is that they are. Look at this. Look at this froggo. Look at that. I just got a cat recently. So, you know, the cat's eyes look kind of like that. And I just, I guess I'm just a sucker for, I've been brainwashed by toxoplasmosis. Spore frog, uh, is a fog frog. Fog frog is, I think what we should call this. That should be the nickname. Sack it to fog, prevent all damage. 
Uh, again, in a toolboxy deck, in a toolboxy Marin build, in a meta where people are winning with damage, which is most of them, yeah, you can really annoy opponents by just always having this up as an option. Uh, it's very hard to deal with too. If someone tries to exile it, just sack it to itself. Very, very, very good. Um, I, <laughs> I'm not running it though, because again, I'm going with a more linear token build, not so much of a toolbox build. Um, but yeah, can see the argument for it, absolutely. Uh, you just don't want to dedicate too, too, too many deck slots to cards just because they might work with Marin, because Marin doesn't need to reanimate, doesn't, doesn't get to reanimate more than one creature per turn. It might be better to just reanimate something a little bit more potent. Although, yeah, this this can save your ass. That's that's for darn sure. Butcher of Malakar. I, I would definitely run this if I was uh, trying to win with a more standard, like, mid-range flyer sort of strategy. But, you know, as I've been saying, I'm, I'm trying to go wide. I'm trying to make a lot of tokens. Uh, I'm trying to make those tokens big and just, like, trample over uh, all my opponents to death. So, um, y y right, it, this card is good. It is good. I, guess, I feel like I'm saying that for every card in Marin. Marin lends herself to a diverse array of strategies. Really, my, my more overarching advice here is just, just pick a strategy. Like, don't get spread too thin. Don't go kind of token deck, kind of toolbox deck, kind of mid-range flyer deck. Don't do that. Pick one, okay, and go all in in that direction. If the one you pick is mid-range flyers to win, then Butcher of Malakir is a combination of, like, you know, one third of a win condition plus really solid uh, control card. Uh, but yeah, for my deck, not doing it just because super linear tokens is the idea. Birthing Pod, yeah, same thing. I'm saying the same thing for every card for Marin. Really good toolbox card, but it requires you to build around it. Um, you need to figure out what your chain is here, and you want to have a couple backups even. So you need a one drop, you need a two drop, you need a three drop, you need a four drop, you need a five drop, and you need to be getting value at each of those CMCs. Uh, my deck, super linear, token deck, where I haven't put a lot of thought into what the CMC is. Um, I feel like often I'd be sacking a one drop mana dork to get a two drop mana dork, and that's not so good. Um, and so, you know, no denying that Birthing Pod is an amazing card. I am not running it <laughs> in my particular Marin build. But you can in yours. You just have to build around it more. Uh, be very good in a toolboxy show for the hundredth time. Journey to Eternity and, oh, Atzal Cave of Eternity. Okay. Um, again, these are the Ixalan flippy doodles that are harder to evaluate because you just have to stop and really think about not only the mana cost, but like the tempo involved to get it to go from one mode to another. Uh, so j Journey by itself protects a creature, helps bring it back. You still get the death trigger from Marin, but then it comes back right away and helps you get the uh, juicy ETB that you're so incentivized to run in Marin as it is. And uh, once it transforms, it's a good land. You know, it has ramped you one for three mana, which is not too bad at all. And uh, then for five tap, you can return a creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. A little bit of redundancy with Marin. You know, I, I have been preaching throughout this series that often people are drawn to cards that have effects similar to their commander because they think somehow that makes it better. But in reality, it's just like you don't need that effect because you already have it in your commander. But this is an exception to that. Like, yes, this is similar to Marin's ability, but reanimating two creatures per turn is better than reanimating one per turn you know uh so you have to you have to be able to think a little complexly no one piece of advice that i give here applies to each and every uh situation yeah this card super good i am running it in my marin deck and ah oh, man oh this card sucks this card is terrible it's an artifact which means that people can destroy it really easily uh it's not guaranteed to replace itself because again people can just deal with it right i'm just kidding i'm just kidding this card's amazing i don't know what they i mean the fact that this was standard legal at least e even for like a couple days before wizards realized how badly they messed up ridiculous oh so good i mean yes run three copies of this in your marin deck just kidding just run one that would that'd be a judge call Waiting to happen. Signature cards, there they are one more time. Take a look. Ah, uh, yes. Ooh, there they are. Let's get to the deck tech. EDH rec tech deck tech. I'm calling this deck Dead Dorks Society. Hmm. 
It's a value reanimator deck with a go-wide game plan. That's code for tokens, making a lot of creatures. It's not just tokens, though. I guess we have a lot of mana dorks. We'll get there. They can also go wide. It's explosive and it's resilient. Creature-based ramp advances our board very quickly, and then Marin brings back the fallen. Right, those are the dead dorks that we were just talking about in the title. Uh, our tutor suite. That's right, we run tutors. We're in black. We have access to tutor effects. It gives the deck a slight toolbox feel. Okay, yeah, it, we're not fetching up oddly specific answers for oddly specific problems. But we are fetching up whatever we are missing in our Ferris Wheel of Doom and or whatever catch-all solution works for a given situation. In practice, most of the time, that's going to be a beast within or a decree of pain. Um, so looking at the fundamentals ramp-wise, we are in great shape. That's why it's hot pink. We've got 24 ramp effects, and they are creature-based. That is uh, for two reasons. One, it helps us go wide once we eventually do draw into our Overwhelming Stampede or our Dragon Throne of Tarkir. Um, there's nothing saying that Mana Dorks cannot attack, especially if it's for lethal damage. Um, also, Mana Dorks just synergize with Marin pretty well, better than like a Farseek or a Cultivate would, because when they die, uh, Marin gets a... Well, you get an experience counter from Marin, and uh, they can just come right back unlike Cultivate and Kadam's Reach, which are, you know, one-time use. Uh, the draw selection is not good. Uh, we only have three effects dedicated just to drawing, although we do have ten tutors and grindy value with Marin that helps make up the difference. And I think even in some of the later deck techs in this season, um, I start including tutors in there with the draw count. I, I consider draw and tutors. So that's really 13, and that's actually not so bad. Because uh, worst case, you can just tutor up a draw effect. And uh, best case, you tutor up a win condition, just win right there. Uh, you know, not not so different, although a little different. A little bit of a tempo loss. I guess draw effects are a tempo loss too, but it's just you make up for it by getting more than one card to your hand. I digress, I digress, I digress. Control, we're below average uh, in this deck at 10 control effects. This is a more aggressive build. We are more board focused uh, than most of the other decks in EDH rec tech. We're hoping to um, prevent our opponents from attacking us by attacking them first and keeping their life total down and forcing them to keep up blockers. Uh, but yeah, 10 control effects isn't terrible. It just it could be better. Uh, so here it is again, game plan, ramp, ramp, ramp into an on-curve Marin, hopefully with some mana to spare. Uh, get a sack slash reanimate value loop going, continue ramping, grinding out value, tutor up a token spewer, then overrun problematic opponents before they're quite ready. That's just an example. You don't have to play a super fast game. You can sit back, you can wait till an opportune moment. She's Marin is a super duper flexible commander, both in how you can build her and how you can play the builds uh, you've, you've made with her uh, just because she keeps bringing things back she can keep coming back she's in green which means you have lots of ramps so even if she dies a few times you can still recast her uh, yeah she, she she's good she's just a, a very well-rounded well-designed uh, commander hey 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 do you want to build a really well-designed well-rounded commander deck maybe one that I've recommended maybe something entirely unrelated maybe you have looked at EDH rec for one of your favorite commanders and uh, applying principles you've learned from this show. You've chosen, you know, five or ten cards you want to pick up. Well, if you, if you want to do that, why not pick them up in a way that helps support Pogo Back Gaming, helps incentivize me to create more content like this? Check out FlipSideGaming.com and use the promo code POGO. Every purchase you make there in that way uh, puts a little bit of money into my pocket, uh, and I greatly appreciate it. Also, if you want to help support future content on Pogo Bat Gaming, uh, send me bottom-up deck-building ideas. I want emails. DanBrownUniverse at gmail.com. Uh, EDH rec lends itself to top-down EDH design, uh, right? We start with a commander and go from there and build out from there a good deck. Lends itself to more generic, middle-of-the-road, good stuff decks. It's not the only way to build a deck, though. You can start with a, just a really cool synergy or idea and then build up from there, choosing a commander later in the process. That's what I want to do after this batch of 12 videos. Um, I want to make some more combo... I mean, they're not, they don't have to be combos. I don't really want them to be combos necessarily. They can be, but I, I'd prefer them to just be cool, non-infinite synergies. Uh, send those my way, danbrownuniverse at gmail.com. That's going to be the next TBD-named series. I don't know what I'm going to call it. It's not going to be EDH Rec Tech. 
Oh, there are more of these coming, most likely, sometime in the next decade. Okay, let's look at this. Uh, let's look at this deck tech. Shuffle, 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 shuffle. We're gonna draw our opening hand right here. Take a look at this. We have three lands, uh, two different ways to ramp Mano F Sliver and a Heart Warden here. Uh, Pernicious Deed, really good board wipe. Viscerous of Sack Outlet. And there's nothing I don't like, so that means we're gonna keep it. We're gonna turn one, draw a sump, as they say. <laughs> German. <laughs> I kill myself. I kill myself with how funny I am. We're going to go ahead and get that Viscerous here out there. One drop. Why not? Turn two. Untap. Draw. Avenger of Zendikar. That is one way we plan to win ultimately. But for now, go ahead and just get that Tainted Wood. And let's start rampity rampity ramping with a Heart Warden. Taps for a green mana. And we can sack it to draw a card. So good in Marin. Turn three. Untap. Draw. Another way to ramp. That's totally fine at this point in the game. Uh, forest out there, we have four mana available. I think that we're going to go ahead and assume that Marin is relatively safe uh, at this point in the game. And we might as well, I guess, sacrifice the Viscera Seer to itself. Uh, let me grab an experience counter. counter. <laughs> uh, add one counter there. Uh, we'll go ahead and do that scry one right now. Take a look. Forest. Um, we already have a land in hand for next turn. Uh, I think that we want to put that on bottom. I'll move that to the bottom of my library, and then we'll move to the end of our turn, and the Viscerous Seer comes back, because that's what Marin does with one experience counter. We'll go to turn four here. Untap. Draw. Solemn. Love it. Solemn Simulacrum. MVP of the deck. Faux show. Sure. We'll play that Swamp. Uh, let me just think about this real quick. Make sure there's nothing tricky we might want to do with the... Heart Warden instead. I, I, I really don't think there is. Um, I think our game plan here becomes relatively straightforward. We will uh, say one, two, three, four, like that. Drop the Solemn Simulacrum. We will then search our library. Go ahead and snag. Uh, it looks like we need forests a little bit more. Enter tapped. Um, then we'll go ahead and sack the Solemn to our Viscerous Seer. Add counter here. Oh, and how does the stack work? Okay, right. So if we if we sack it to the Viscera Seer, that's part of the cost of the Viscera Seer. So the Solemn Draw trigger goes on the stack first, and the Scry one is on the stack second. I'm pretty sure I Scry before I draw. I, 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 I'm, yeah, we're going to go with that. Overwhelming Stampede. That's a game plan. That plus Avenger of Zendikar seems like a good way to try and close out the game. We'll go ahead and just, let's go ahead and just draw that card. And then end of turn, um, we do have a Marin trigger on the stack. So we can go ahead and bring a Solemn Simulacrum on back. Turn five. Untap. Draw. A Bloom and Marsh. That's a land. You know, not maybe it doesn't enter untapped at this point in the game, but it's still a land. We're going to play it as a land. There you go. Um, I have to think we have one, two, three, four, five, six mana available to us. Not quite... Avenger of Zendikar territory just yet. Um, some options here might be to Manoef, Utopia Tree. We could also start chaining Solemn Simulacrums even more efficiently once we get Marin up to four experience counters. That, that is almost never the wrong thing to do, I feel like, uh, if we're just trying to grind out long-term value. I mean, we'd have to assess the board. Pernicious Deed is another option depending on what our opponents are getting up to. If they're playing you know, a very board-heavy game, it might be worth thinking about getting that out there. If they're playing a more controlly game, I mean, maybe we wouldn't have been able to do everything we've done so far, but at the same time, might not want to drop a pernicious D. It just depends. I think, I think for the sake of gold fishing, we're going to go with the Solemn plan. Uh, so for four, we'll drop another Solemn, enters the battlefield, search our library for a land. We will grab a Swamp this time. If there are there they are ah, I, I'm down at the bottom of alphabetical order uh, then we will go ahead and sack the solemn to the viscera seer get another experience counter right there we will scry one it's a land I don't know we might be to the point of the game where we don't really want that many more lands I'm gonna move that to the bottom um, and then we will draw for solemn yeah, so we got to land anyway um, and then uh, pro probably going to do a 1-2 to sack the Heart Warden to itself to draw a card. Got another land there. Glad we scribed the other land to the bottom. We'll add a counter here. We have four counters. And that means at our end step, turn five, Solemn's just coming right back. 
into play, which means we're going to be thinning our deck out even more. Uh, you know, let's get another swamp since we already have two forests in hand. Whoa. There we go. Swampity, swampity. Bippity, boppity. Boopity, turn sixity. Right? Yep. Seems good to me. Untap. Big untap step. Draw. Mastermind's acquisition. Now we're getting somewhere. I'll drop a land for turn. It's a forest. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine mana at our disposal. Could be a pretty big Avenger of Zendikar. Um, I mean, how, how much how much damage would that be potentially next turn for an overwhelming stampede? That could just be. If not the end of the game, at least a way to knock out problem opponents. I mean, again, this is assuming that there's no interaction. If there needed to be more interaction in this game, we'd probably go with a pernicious deed game plan, like I said earlier, instead of the solemn game plan. But for now, yeah, this Avengers Endicard is looking mighty fine. I am going to do that. One, two, three, four, five, six, I don't know, seven right there. Avenger of Zendikar comes into play. We're going to get... How many, how many lands is that? I have, seven, I have nine lands. Right. So let's go ahead and say zero one plant. Uh, and to simplify this, let's say I have nine of them. The yellow counters are going to be the number of plants. All right. Um, then we might as well, I guess, for two mana, just get another mana source, a mana weft sliver or whatever, and uh, sacrifice the solemn to the viscera seer. We will scry one, it is a forest. We will move that to the bottom of our library. We will then draw a forest anyway. We will move to our end step. Solemn will come back into play and we will get a trigger on that. We will end up three and snag yeah, another swamp into play. Uh, uh. Well, I just tapped everything. Doesn't matter. I'm not doing anything else with the turn. Uh, that's gonna trigger Avenger of Zendikar, which means all of these plants are going to get a plus one plus one counter, which makes them one twos. And they are one, we have nine one two plants. Right, that's what Avenger does. Right? Sometimes I take for granted my knowledge of cards and I'm actually wrong about them. You know, when it enters, we make a plant for every land and whenever land enters, they all get a counter. Yes, I'm doing that correctly. All right, let's go ahead and uh, see if we can do a lot of damage on turn seven. Draw a so I love Sol Ring. Sol Ring is so good. Uh, we'll play a land here. That will give us another red counter, another plus one, plus one counter, which will make these all two threes. Um, yeah, so tap that, get our soul ring into play. Why not go ahead and consolidate our board? Just a dollop, just a scotch. I'm, f I'm looking at this to make sure there's nothing obvious I'm forgetting. Like, we need to save five mana for the overwhelming stampede. So let's say we have one, two, three over here four, five, which leaves us with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, which would be three additional after a Mastermind's Acquisition if we wanted to look for something to maybe make the board even bigger, potentially, or to try to, yeah, I mean, might as well look, again, I don't have encyclopedic knowledge of these decks because I made them all, you know, very quickly, I haven't actually played these decks in real play groups um, <laughs> ever. So I'm just going to take a look and see what we have. See if there's not a 3 CMC or less way to make my board even bigger. The answer might be no. It might just be... Let's see. When Enchanted Creature dies... and This just reanimates things. Um, we could um, sudden spoiling to get rid of any opponents that have big blockers. That jumps out as maybe a way to just use the extra mana that we have on the turn to try to make a, a potentially lethal turn even lethaler. Yeah, let's go ahead and just do it that way. I'll snag a sudden spoiling. Uh, don't even have to reveal it, but um, put that in my graveyard. Then we shall... Uh, yeah, yeah, you know what, let's just one, two, three, four, five. Overwhelming Stampede. Everything is going to get plus five, plus five, and trample. Which means that this is going to become a six, six trampler. This is going to become an eight, nine trampler. This is going to become a seven, seven. 
Uh, this is going to become a 10-10. This is going to become a 6-6. Six, six. You see where this is going, right? And then these, I mean, obviously. And then this is going to become a 7-8. Eight trampler. This is like my least favorite part of magic, just doing like rudimentary algebra, but just a lot of it. It's like I'm in second grade again, and I have like an hour of homework. Like why am I, it's not even fun math. It's just grindy, awful math. I, that's why I don't play counter decks and token decks. I prefer to just control, 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 and then go infinite. That's the fun kind of math. Anyway, we're looking at it. Seven damage times nine. Oh, yeah, here's more of that homework again. It comes out to what? What? That's 63 plus six is 69. 79. 86 plus eight is going to be 90. Wait, wait, wait. I said 86, right? Plus eight is going to be 94. It's, a, it's 100 damage. Wow. I think. If I did my mental math right, and I'm not going to check it, but it's 100 damage even, which, uh, you know... Maybe that's enough to win the game. Especially if we can suddenly spoil any opponent's board that uh, has a lot of, like, big, fat blockers. Um, yeah, great, cool. Then we swing for maybe lethal, if not lethal, hopefully enough to uh, give us an overwhelming stampede of an advantage in the rest of the game. There you have it, people. This has been EDH Rec Tech. I have been Daniel Brown, and I still will be next week. Remember that the real game is the metagame, and the real win condition is having the most fun. Good luck, and have fun. And give, give your mom a call real quick, you know, at some point, at some point in the next few days. She'd appreciate hearing from me. But, uh, all right, all right, cool. All right, see you then. See you, see you soon. Goodbye.